Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Yvonne, and I'm a senior scientist with medicinal genomics. Um, they let me out of the lab this week to come and speak to you guys about some um, data that we've collected over the past several years showing how culture-based cannabis microbial testing um, can put the consumer at risk. So this is just a, a brief history of the past 350 years in micro and molecular bio. Um, it all started back in 1767 when Van Leeuwenhoek started the study of microbiology. Um, Julius Petrie invented the Petri dish in 1887, and in 1953, we all know Watson and Crick, with the help of Rosalind Franklin, discovered the structure of DNA. The field of micro, uh, molecular biology was revolutionized in 1983 with Carrie Mollis's invention of, of the polymerase chain reaction, or as we like to call it, PCR. And in 2003, the Human Genome Project was completed after 13, a 13-year 13 endeavor. Molecular biology has come a long way in a short amount of time. Today, we can sequence the human genome in 36 hours compared to the 13 years it took almost 30 years ago. Yet, in a world of microbiology, we're still relying on a technique that's 161 years old. So here are some examples of your traditional culture-based methods. You've got plating, gram staining, microscopy, and biochemical testing. Um, they have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, the advantages are they're cheap, they're sensitive, you can get down to single copy, single colony forming units, sorry, and they're reliable. Disadvantages are they're time consuming, it can take days to grow, grow the, the cultures depending on what you're growing. Labor intensive, multiple dilutions, multiple plates, different incubation times. And not all microorganisms grow on or in artificial media. And that's an important point. Culture-based testing on cannabis. Um, currently, there's three major players in, in the field. Um, 3M Petri Films, Hardy Diagnostic Plates, and the Biomary U Tempo Cartridge. Um, all these three companies have all crossed over from the food industry into the cannabis industry. However, unlike food testing, cannabis testing has to consider various routes of administration beyond just oral consumption. Cannabis flour produces high concentrations of antimicrobials, cannabinoids, terpenoids, and thus represent a different matrix than traditional foods. None of these have been validated on a cannabis matrix which according to mul multiple regulatory bodies, you have to do a new validation once you change your matrix. In the molecular, um, in the molecular world um, for microbial-based testing, you have hybridization, PCR, sequencing, and DNA microarray. Um, in the cannabis space, molecular methods being used are qPCR and microarray, and sometimes sequencing. Uh, we at Medicinal Genomics focus on qPCR in sequencing. So what are the advantages? Advantages of qPCR over plating is that they're faster. You can, reserve, you can obtain results in hours as opposed to days. Bacteria can take anywhere between 24 and 48 hours to grow, and yeast and molds 48 to 72 hours to grow. qPCR is more accurate. Um, if the primers don't bind to the sequence that you're looking at, they're not, the assay is not gonna work. So qPCR is looking for specific DNA sequences shared by a family of microbes. If the DNA isn't present, qPCR isn't gonna detect it. qPCR is more specific. If the DNA sequence you're looking for isn't there, I'm sorry. <laughs> if the DNA sequence is known, an assay can be designed to target that species. Specific DNA, um, this is important, especially, oh, shh, sorry. This is important in, um, in the case of aspergillus. There are many species of aspergillus, yet there are only four pathogenic species in cannabis testing, and those are aspergillus flavus, fumigatus, niger, and terius. And qPCR is scal scalable. Everything's done in a 96-well plate format, and this allows for automation to be used. So. Cannabis is a, a unique, unique matrix. You have flour, extracts and concentrates, and MIPS, which are marijuana-infused marijuana products. Lipid-rich matrices like flour, oil, concentrate, and MIPS cannot be sampled with a simple aqueous immersion. Instead, the lipids need to be dissolved 
need, need to be disrupted so that they can be dissolved in water to fully, uh, to fully get an idea of what you're sampling. This usually re requires a detergent. And this isn't good for culture-based methods because the detergent can also break down the cell wall of the microorganisms that you're looking at and therefore render them not viable to be growing on your media. So while these quick aqueous preps are good for quick turnaround time and not having to extract DNA, they really um, put you at a disadvantage of, of sampling what you're truly looking at. And some other people before me have talked about the high, how, how the cannabis matrix is very hydrophobic. So this is the current state um, regulate, regulations um, in the US. And this is an ever-changing map, and it's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure. Um, the many states follow, will reference the USP or the AHP. The main difference between these two is that um, the USP calls for the detection of, of Pseudomonas and staph, while the, US, um, while the AHP does not. Um, some states choose to look for um, pathogenic uh, stack E. coli, while others are just looking at E. coli. Um, and then you've got the BCC in California, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, and they actually did some re research before coming out with their recommendations, and they have um, species-specific lists, and they're just looking at the organisms that actually are harmful and pathogenic to humans. Um, and they focus on Salmonella, Stechi coli, and, and the four species of Aspergillus. And some other states ha have picked up on those regulations. Um, Alaska, um, Nevada, while they do have total counts, they also now have Aspergillus species specific. And um, Florida and Vermont are, are looking into going with those regulations. Now, what makes the AHP and the USP regulations difficult in cannabis testing is that they all call for total tests, and total yeast and mold and total aerobic tests are unable to differentiate between pathogenic, beneficial, and benign yeast, molds, and bacteria. And this makes them poor indicators of safety. A low total result doesn't mean that your sample is harmful to consumers, and a high total count, oh, I'm sorry, that's not. A low total result does not mean a sample is free of pathogens, and a high total count doesn't mean that a sample is harmful, con harmful to consumers. Like I said earlier, cannabis is a very unique matrix, and you cannot simply slap on a food regulation and expect every everything to work. So now I've got some data to support some of this. Um, according to the, so Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a biotolerant gram-negative bacteria. That's, this is important, it's a bacteria. According to the USP, there is, quote, no strict definition of this group of microorganisms. Well, that's helpful. And they grow operationally as those microorganisms that show growth in the standard conditions on vial, violet, red, blue glu glucose agar. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa is responsible for 11 to 14% of hospital-acquired infections. So you don't want your in immunocompromised cannabis patient getting this. So we set out to look at this. We um, obtained two different species from ATCC, and we grew them according to um, the 3M Petri film product literature, uh, 24 hours, 32C. And according to their literature, Pseudomonas should appear as red colonies without gas or acid. As you can see, there's no growth. So we took that 1 to 100 dilution after 24 hours, and we tested it on our qPCR assays, um, our three qPCR assays that can detect Pseudomonas. And as you can see, we were able to detect, detect it. Now, Pseudomonas is a bacteria, yet through sequencing studies we've performed with third-party testing labs, we see it popping hot on total yeast and mold tests. So this, is this going to work? No. Okay, this cartridge, you can see the yellow growth. That's Pseudomonas growing in a Tempo Biomary U yeast and mold cartridge. Now, the Tempo platform utilizes a pH-sensitive fluorescent dye to monitor the growth. As, a decrease in, as the pH decreases, the fluorescence results also decrease, indicating that the organism is growing. So this is a, a false positive result. 
And it's because Pseudomonas um, is an acid-producing bacteria, much like Bacillus. So to test this theory, we obtained a culture from ATCC, and we grew it up. It was actually a chloramphenicol resistant Pseudomonas, and we grew it up in the presence of chloramphenicol. And we shipped it off to two third-party testing labs in Massachusetts. And this is an example of a report we got back. And as you can see, it failed total aerobic, as it should. Pseudomonas is a bacteria. It also failed the total yeast and mold test. That shouldn't have happened. It passed the biotolerant gram-negative test. Pseudomonas is biotolerant gram-negative. So again, this is putting your consumers at risk. You're, you're getting a false positive on something that's not even growing, that shouldn't be growing there, and you get a false negative for a biotolerant gram negative. Biotolerant gram negative is a type of bacteria that you don't want growing on your plants. So we've done some um, extensive studies with, with several different um, customers, and this is part of our paper that we did with a third-party testing lab in Massachusetts. And we did some sequencing. And we did sequencing of the flower before it was exposed to culture, and then we, we, t we scraped the colonies, we opened up the biomary bio cartridge, and we extracted the DNA after culture. So this is these are some examples of bacterial sequencing results off of total yeast and mold tests. And as you can see, the blue line up top, that's our friend Pseudomonas growing in yeast and mold. And then down the bottom, Bacillus, again, another acid-producing bacteria. These, are, these bacterias are growing in yeast and mold cartridges. And then there's another little blip down there, and that's botulitum. That's something that you definitely don't want on your cannabis. But we think that's growing due to the fact that these cartridges are, are more in an anaerobic-type state. So when we did this sequencing, we were targeting the 16S region of the bacteria. We did the same with the yeast and mold that was growing on. So the yeast and mold assay that we have, we're targeting the ITS region. And again, you can see that what the, culture, what the DNA is before, the gray bars, is much different than what you're seeing after culture. So here you're seeing, before culture, there's a high level of penicillium. After culture, there's high levels of trichoderma. Trichoderma are widely used in the agriculture, agricultural industry as fungicides. So what's happening here is the trichoderma is eating the penicillium. So you're seeing a different result after culture, and it's not what was on there beforehand. Penicillium is also, you don't want that growing, but that's not what we're looking at here. And then you've got aspergillus. Aspergillus is, is the one thing that has caused a death in cannabis. It's not growing after culture, and that's a problem. And there's more evidence for this. Aspergillus grows as heterogeneous macrocolonies. And that's a fancy word for it grows in these clumps, clumps of conidia that can be hundreds to thousands of, of, of filamentaceous growth packing together. So instead of it forming nice single colonies like you're used to seeing on a bacterial plate, they grow in these hamburger type clumps. So, so you look at this and you could count you know, okay, that one, maybe there's three growing there. And when actual, actual, actuality, it's probably about three times as much. And you get a sampling bias. You know, it, here it is growing at the 1 to 100 dilution on the 3M Petri films, but on the Stabdex agar plates, there's nothing. So that's a problem. The clumping causes a sampling bias. And we see this um, in, in our qPCR results. So um, we obtained 11 different um, yeast and molds from ATCC, and we compared um, qPCR versus plating methods. And for nine of the 11, organi is, nine of the 11 organisms, they match up really well, except for these two, Aspergillus japonicus and Aspergillus flavus. And they're threefold off compared to what the qPCR results are. And this is because Aspergillus clumps and it creates a sampling bias during plating and effect effectively limits the dynamic range of the assay in complicating the CFU program accuracy. And this is a reason why qPCR is better able to detect aspergillus compared to culture. So here's some more data, and, th and this is um, a, a, 
testing MIPS. So E. coli was grown up and spiked in the presence of candy. So you'll see um, the top is E. coli and TSB, which is our control, and the bottom is TSB, candy, and E. coli. So um, according to 3M, total aerobic plate count provides total aerobic count after 48 hours. And if you look after 48 hours, I really wish this would work. Three minutes. You can see growth. And it's not until 96 hours that the, the E. coli and candy start showing up. So this again, would you, after 48 hours, you would say, oh, there's, there's nothing present, we'll, we'll pass this. See it again in, in the coliform plates. Again, 40, 24 to 48 hours. At the 48 hour time plate point, you can see without the presence of candy, you've got colonies, and in the presence of candy, there's nothing. So this is a great picture because this shows the importance of DNA and how, and how it can be used in differentiating different species. So you've got your monarch butterfly. It goes through a huge state of metamorphosis. It's got the same genome. Those two organisms look completely different, but they have the same genome. The different genomes, those are four different species of aspergillus. Only one of them is pathogenic. Only one of them is harmful. So if you're passing, if you're passing limit for a total yeast and mold test is 10,000 CFUs, and 5,000 of them are aspergillus niger, niger, the consumer is at a much greater risk with a passing total yeast and mold result than with a result indicating failure in a spe species specific assay. So I'm running out of time. So some of my key points. Because culture-based methods can grow off target organisms, this leads to inflated counts that leads to higher failure rates. Culture-based methods distort what is actually present on the plant and other matrices and therefore provides inaccurate picture of microbial risks. Molecular-based methods can capture specific microbial risks while many of these risks fail to be detected by culture-based methods due to their slow growth in these mediums. And the complexity of different cannabis matrices affect the readout chemistry and commonly used culture methods and therefore given an inaccurate count of the potential threats present. One minute. Acknowledgements and thank you. I'll be available for questions. Or we can do one quick. Great, thank you. You're welcome. I get it. <laughs> Excellent presentation and important data. I'm wondering, because outside of the immunosuppressed, I suspect the biggest risk to consumers is mycotoxins rather than aspergillus infection. Could you comment if you've looked into that at all? Um, no, we currently are not doing any microtoxin testing. I do know that most of the states require some sort of microtoxin testing, and that's being done more at the chemistry level than at the molecular level. 